No one covers the sports media game better than our guest today. He is the best newsbreaker in that department as well. He is Bobby Burak. Outkick the coverage is where his work is showcased. Obviously, a great job he does with Clay Travis and his crew. He is on Twitter, Bobby, at Burak, Bobby underscore. I'm Brian Fenley. I'm on Twitter at Brian Fenley and anchor at FSR. Bobby, it is a, it's a pleasure to have you, and I know as much as you have to be on top of the news cycle, I, I don't know when you sleep. So take us into a day in the life of what you're doing because you're breaking news, you're following news, and you're on the forefront of what's going on. Yes, so Brian, first of all, I appreciate you having me on. Uh, uh, my pleasure. Uh, you, you know, for me, the thing is I don't have a set schedule. And the, there's good and there's bad of that. Now, the bad yeah. is, is that – it's nearly impossible on a, especially a weekday when, when most uh, people around the industry are in contact with me to really set aside a lot of time to say for a meeting or a Zoom call mm -hmm. because you never know what's going to happen. I wake up most days having no idea what I'm going to be talking about, writing about, who I'm going to be talking to, or what the story of the day is going to be. I mean, very I mean, okay, so Tuesday was an exception. I knew the debate was going to be the big sure. story on Tuesday. But the vast majority of days, I have no clue what I'm going to be waking up to. And a lot of times, I never know how long I'll be on the phone with somebody, how long I'll be writing something. So when I first wake up, I try to wake up at a time to get ahead of the news cycle because I don't know where I'm going to be or when I'm going to have time to check back in on this stuff. So I try to wake up around uh, seven o'clock or so and really catch up on the news of the day. When I was at the big lead, it was mostly just sports and sports media. So I'd watch shows like Get Off and uh, Good Morning Football and do a lot of reading. But now I'm um, dabbling a lot on the news side, the political side. So I usually start out by uh, recording Fox and Friends and the Morning Joe and trying to hear both sides, see what they're doing. So that's really how I start. And about 9, 9.30, usually the phone starts ringing. I start talking to people around the industry, chasing stories, um, you know, communicate with the editors at OutKick, the staff at OutKick. And after that, you know, it really just takes its own path. Uh, I could be writing for a couple hours. I could be doing something quick. Uh, I could be chasing a story, uh, talking to networks, uh, people around the industry. So it's so random. So I really try to get ahead of the news cycle in the morning because from about 9 a.m. until really I go to bed, it's such an unpredictable day and uh, time cycle. What's the most thrilling aspect of breaking a story and beating everyone to what is breaking news and you being on the cusp of it and, and, and obviously building those relationships and contacts to make that happen? Well, I think here's, well, here's the part that, again, a lot of unpredictability. Yeah. I don't know who else is on something that I know. Like I could hear mm. something, be chasing it, but I have no idea. Do my competitors know? Are they writing this right now? Are they in the confirmation stage? Or do they have no idea? So you don't know. So you're always concerned in the back of your mind, well, if I don't get this out in the next five minutes, could I get beat? But Brian, I'm someone, for, I'll say for better, I don't put something out there unless I 1,000% am confident in it. Now, I've lost stories by that because sometimes I'm checking with a third, fourth source when I already have it nailed down, and I've lost stories that way. But I want to make sure when I put something out there, people know, okay, that's true. There's no speculation. There's no, well, is he right? Is he wrong? I want people to know that. So when I know a story, it's frustrating and stressful yeah. because I yeah. know it, but I'm still yeah. wanting that extra confirmation. And you can't always guarantee that because some of the information I have, not a lot of people know about. Uh, so many of the times, I mean, you know, I, I could know it at two o'clock and don't put something out there until eight o'clock because I'm waiting on just that one final confirmation. Mm -hmm. So for that six hours, I'm panicking, checking my phone, are my competitors writing about this? Have they already scooped me on it? Because that happens. I mean, there's been a lot of times where I'm holding something, waiting for that final word, and, you know, another outlet has it. And at that point, the story's dead. That's a killer. That's, that's a loss for me, but that's part of it. So the thrill of it is when you, when you do get the win is when you are the first one to break it. Um, but again, a lot of that is out of your control just because depending on how you want to approach it. Um, yeah, I look at someone like uh, some of the sports news breakers and they're breaking so many stories per day. I can't imagine the type of just um, the type of stress they deal with knowing yeah. I mean, some of these reporters are two seconds apart. I mean, if you look at yeah. Rappaport Schefter's time, <laughs> most of it is pretty much verbatim the same wording, but yeah. 20 seconds apart. 
uh, luckily in sports media, or not, you know, I guess now I just cover media in general, that doesn't happen as often, but there are times where uh, you, you will see reporters pretty much have the same information at the same time. Uh, you know, some of that is network communication, some of that is just randomly, uh, because you know, when you report a story, when you, when you hit the word publish and it's loading, when it's saying sending, sending, sending out, somebody could be sending, sending, sending out at the same time. So very, again, unpredictable best describes my job and my life on a day-to-day -day basis. Bobby Barak is with us with OutKick. I'm Brian Fenley. How did you end up at OutKick? Because you were doing great work with the big lead, and I want to ask you how you got to the big lead, but from what you did at the big lead, got the attention of Clay Travis and others, why did they feel like you had such a, a huge uh, future in front of you and why they wanted to take a chance on you? So, so I started writing um, four years ago now, or so around there, I think, um, for a lot of random sports blogs. Uh, I'm not going to say their names because uh, I think some of them are not around anymore or whatever, but I was really writing about football. And I found myself bored in thinking, I think I have a lot more to contribute to this conversation than me ranking. I think I was writing for a Packers blog at the time, you know, ranking the Packers 53 man roster or, you know, writing about how they, they compare to the bears. Um, that was never really of interest to me. So luckily I was somewhere where the, um, the editor, the guys running it had a lot of trust in me. So I said, Hey, I'm going to start my own podcast. Um, I'm just going to do a podcast. I'm going to record it myself. And I'm going to bring on media people because I, I think that the way media is covered is poor. Um, so I started doing that, um, reaching out to people um, at ESPN, FS1, Fox Sports Radio. And luckily, it worked out pretty well. Um, in the first month or so, I was able to get people on like Jamel Hill, um, who I don't think I'd ever get on now. <laughs> but I'm like, this is four years ago and Jamel Hill is not the Jamel Hill now. So like, I don't want everybody to think that. Like, I, So Jamel Hill has changed in those four years. But anyways, um, but it, it got to a point where I just didn't agree with management. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to do this podcast by myself. I don't need anybody else. Um, I have a friend of mine, Patrick Hatton, who did some production work for it. He was doing his own thing too. So we, we started an RSS feed and iTunes. So I did that for about five months, bringing on sports media people, um, every single week. It was very important to me to have that consistency every Tuesday. Uh, you know, um, so it went, went pretty well. You know, a lot of people from ESPN, Fox, um, I'm trying to think who else, um, really just anybody, uh, boxing people, CBS, uh, even sports media writers. At that time, I was not writing about sports media, so I brought on uh, like Ryan Glass, Peagle, Michael McCarthy. Uh, and one of the people I had on early in the run was Jason McIntyre, who at the time was editor in chief of the big lead. And they did some uh, hiring uh, about five months after I started the podcast. I remember the day I was actually, um, it was like during football season, I was just watching a football game, it was snowing outside or whatever. And I got a call from New York. And I was like, oh, another telemarketer. No, another telemarketer. What, what do they want? I, I thought about answers. I was like, well, I'll answer to 6.30 at night or so. So I called him and he told me who it was, which obviously I knew who he was. He said, hey, uh, you know, I, I heard about your reputation as a grinder and you're someone that I want to bring on to the big lead. So that started there and really began at first just opining on sports media. My first piece was who's the most likely to be the face of ESPN of five years, oh. which five years from that time is approaching. So just at that point, um, I had connections through the podcast. Like I said, the podcast went successfully as far as building connections. I'm not sure that a lot of people were listening outside the industry, but I was able to build those contacts. So, you know, so while writing those opinion pieces, staying in contact, continuing to host the podcast, you start to um, develop really valuable connections and you start to have insight and, and, you know, really it just took off from there, you know, if you want to say that. And um, so I did that for two and a half years, the big lead, I uh, had an ownership change, but it didn't change much as far as what I was doing. Um, then in March or in February, late February, Clay Travis had called me and said, hey, I'm expanding OutKick in a big way, and I want you to be a part of it, you and some other ones. So, uh, you know, um, you know, we had a conversation, and then we, we aligned on our visions and stuff. So I started there uh, May 1st. Um, here we are now, 1st of Oct October. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, the, I don't know if the story is, the story is not one that I think is overwhelmingly fascinating, but it was a lot of, a lot of, again, random, unpredictable things happen. Like I didn't plan a lot of this stuff. Like I just planned on doing a podcast because I wanted to do one. I didn't plan on going to the big league. You know, they came to me, you know, I, 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 um, you know, I did not really plan on 
you know, also adding like the political news media beat. But once I got to Outkick, it was something I've always wanted to do. And I couldn't do it other places. And it was a perfect opportunity for me to expand and cover Fox News, CNN, MSNBC. Because Brian, um, I'll be honest, that industry fascinates me more than sports media, believe it or not. Um, I, I, I'm someone that's always enjoyed politics. Um, I was not able to comment, talk about them for a while. Um, so, you know, it's really important for me to get my voice out there and also talk about those that are covering it because I think there's a lot of irresponsible coverage and a lot of good coverage. And that industry, I think, is so poorly covered by people like Brian Stelter. So uh, I really enjoy being able to dabble in that industry. And there's a lot of interest in there, I think, more than people would realize. You said that this is perhaps unexpected for you to be where you are, but you think about you've put yourself into those situations by opening yourself up to, to doing all of these different activities so that you've gotten the attention thrown your way. Like you've put yourself in these positions to be discovered, which is a great job on you, which has turned out magically and wonderfully for you. When you got that phone call from Clay, did you think it was a telemarketer? No, I, I had known Clay a little you bit. You know Clay. So I got okay. it. I knew it. Like Clay. Yeah. Well, unlike Jason McIntyre, but like I had known Clay. Yeah. I would say well, but I had I had known him for. I, I know. I mean, we had. I did an interview with him at the big league kind of early on, but we had not stayed in contact. But we had talked a few times in between then and now, so we did have each other's numbers. So I knew it when it said Clay Traps. Like, okay, Clay's calling me, but I didn't know that he was calling for that. But um, so, so yeah, not, it wasn't quite as like odd as, cause like, yeah. honestly, I could have just ignored Jason McIntyre's number and <laughs> never <laughs> talked to him. I didn't know whose number it was. Um, but, uh, but honestly, it's, it's funny you bring that up because um, now when I get a call from New York, LA, and I don't know that number or Bristol or Connecticut, I answer it. But like at the time, yeah. four years ago when I got those numbers, I was like, well, there's nobody here in New York trying to get a hold of me. But now uh, those are pretty, uh, pretty common phone calls now. So usually when I get a phone call, I don't know the number. Uh, unless it's from my location, like where I live, and I don't really talk to a lot of people where I live, I don't answer it. But if it's from one of those cities or something, uh, yeah, I'm definitely going to answer it. And clearly it would be Nashville. So that, it's a little different. But uh, yeah, times have changed as far as that goes. Yeah, and with all these phone calls you're getting, sometimes they can be – a source of a scoop. And so that brings me to my next question. Since you've been at Outkick, what has been the newsbreaker nugget that you would put highest up on your trophy case? I'd say Mike Greenberg's return to ESPN radio. I think, I think that one was, I think it was something that um, it, it caught a lot of attention because that is a radio sports radio legend. Now there was some reports early on that, that it was a possibility, but getting that, you know, that it was going to happen, I think carries a lot of weight. Um, that's something that a lot of newsbreakers debate all the time. Okay. You know, somebody said this could happen is the next story that is going to happen. I say yes, because things could happen all the time. If, if it reports out that something could happen and you can say that it's done, it, it's definitely worth writing up and reporting. So I'll say that, but honestly, um, it actually wasn't even a report. I think the story that I would consider my biggest win, I have it pinned to my Twitter profile, is yeah. Tucker Carlson's ratings in the um, coveted 25 to 54 demographic. Um, I still get tweets. Actually, today, I got like, I don't know, I don't know if somebody retweeted or what, but I have a lot of people saying how much they hate me and all this stuff. <laughs> that Tucker Carlson piece. But uh, even hidden in all the hate mail and all that stuff, uh, I met a lot of people through that piece. And that, that's something that I worked on for a couple of days. And I was really proud with the results and the information, the perspective that was in that. So I don't think it's always about breaking news, but it's also putting the knowledge that you have into an opinion story, because opinions can last a long time. A news story might only last two, three hours. You were pretty spot on. This is a chance for you to boast. You projected the viewership numbers for that first debate. You had said 73 million and it was 73 million. That has to help your credibility a whole lot. You know, I'm actually disappointed, Brian, that I have not gotten more credit. I don't think people realize <laughs> how hard that is to out of it could be any number in the world. For the fact that I got it on the button, 73 million, I think I deserve more credit. Uh, yeah. not on the, I do. Like, I honestly think people in, should tweet at me and say, wow, look at that. 73 million right on the dot. Like I got one guy that I thought sent me a nice note about it. People just overlooked that. That, that. I saw a lot of people saying, oh, 100 million, 88 million, 70, 70 million. No, it was 73 million, my projection. So uh, I think I need more credit on that. Yeah. Well, hopefully people will, when people watch and listen to this podcast, they'll be once again, 
thrown to the attention of what you did there. So another, by the way, in all, in all seriousness, I'm joking there. Uh, I actually was not shocked that I was, I mean, listen, there's no way of knowing that you're going to be hundred percent. Right. But I was yeah. confident I was going to be in the ballpark there for a couple of reasons. Um, you know, I, this was going to be a newsworthy debate, but it doesn't carry the same mystique that Clinton Trump did for a couple of reasons. One, Trump in 2016, you still had a lot of GOP traditional voters, conservatives that were unsure of Trump. At this point, they either are for him or against him. Now, there's still a lot of never Trumpers and there's some that are all in on him. But in 2016, there was still a large section of conservative voters that were unsure of Trump and deciding, OK, can I get behind a non-traditional candidate, a former reality TV star? So that debate was really important for them to see that. Where Tuesday night, pretty much everybody knows at this point what kind of president Trump is, good, bad, and different. Um, so I think that the, you know, those opinions are much more determined than they were in 2016. So I said, okay, they're going to be down probably about 10 million there. And also, um, people forget now, Clinton was a highly polarizing candidate. Um, would argue outside of Trump, who she was going against, one of the most polarizing candidates in the past six, seven elections. Um, Biden is not that. Now, listen, people have fun mocking him and stuff, but he's really overall a boring candidate. So if you combine those two factors, I figured, okay, I thought, you know, about, about a 10, 11, 12 million uh, viewer drop. So again, I was not shocked that I was in the ballpark. I was surprised that I was on the button because, you know, I, it could have been 71, 72, 73, 74. But uh, yeah, I, I did not see this one breaking records because of that. I don't know that that record Trump-Hillary debate won at 84 million will ever be top. I think it could go down forever as the highest rated debate. Wow. Bobby Brown. Some, some of that, now some of that, again, is as we project forward, there's sure. going to be less appetite for TV viewing. Now, you know, I think a lot of people are going to start consuming that stuff, especially after Tuesday, not just streaming, but also like through clips. I think people are going to look for highlights of it. So I just don't know that that is ever going to be top. It's going to be hard to ever have a candidate as of interest as Trump is. Now, again, that's not political. That, that's a fact. I mean, yeah. both sides are as interested in Trump as they have been in any candidate in most of our lifetimes. What to you would be something you would call like career sabotage based upon like something that would be tweeted or that would, you know, be of that much effect and impact to, to do that. And then also what is your take on the whole cancel culture as well? Yeah, I think, I think cancel culture is um, really a bunch of pathetic people that wake up want to make people as miserable as they are. Um, if you're going out of your way to cost somebody their job because you disagree with them or you don't like what they have to say, that says everything about you. Um, if somebody actually wants to make a change, you try to convince that person they're wrong. And here's why. When you try to omit them from the conversation, that, that, that's not changing anybody's mind. Um, now, again, I want to be clear. There are things that people say on social media that deserve costing them their job. No, sure. I, I, I tell you, Brian, I have never called for anybody's job, ever. Uh, I, I've never said this person should be fired. Um, I don't do that. Um, it's not my decision to make. But there are times where I can say, okay, you know, look, given that, I mean, I, I understand why the company did that. But a lot of times I see people get fired for something they said because of cancel culture. And I'm just like, that's unfair. Um, so I, I, I uh, Nobody as is as against cancel culture as I am. Um, as far as career sabotage, it was funny. Um, I I don't know if anybody, and I, I say this sincerely, mm. was as early on the NBA ratings decline as I was. Um, I was on it two years ago, very early. Um, I think people still hate me for that initial poll. The NBA is so beloved on Twitter, so beloved in the media. Uh, that's something that I'm going to have to wear on my head for the rest of my life. That I was anti NBA ratings, uh, actually accurate on it. But uh, it's funny you say sabotage because that's something that no one's ever going to get over. <laughs> and uh, you think that's so simple. And it is like, it's such a fact. Like a lot of times I'm just reporting the numbers. Like, Hey, here's down 45%. Like game one, the finals was down 45% from uh, game one last year. Uh, that's a pretty straightforward comment. Uh, it's bad. I mean, the fact that LeBron, the Lakers are down from the Raptors. Bobby Barak dominates social media. Go follow him. Barak Bobby underscore does great work on outkick.com with Clay Travis and his crew. The man has got stardom in his future. If he hasn't already reached it already, it is a pleasure to have you. I'm 
Brian Fenley and Bobby, thanks so much for doing this. I, I really, really enjoyed the conversation and the perspective. And I think a lot of people will find you very fascinating, your take on media. Hey, Brian, appreciate it anytime.